This is May 16th, 2020. Upon arriving at the Provo City Center Temple, Jonathan and I saw that the temple grounds were closed. This seemed to forecast less foot traffic, but I was quickly proven wrong. We were busy almost the entire night. I spoke with a young man who said he was a Christian. He grew up in Idaho. He, was, he had professing Christian parents, if I remember right, who were divorced when he was 12 due to his father's alcoholism. He hasn't been really going to church ever since. He has a distaste over his father's hypocrisy, and he did not like the idea of paying money to a pastor. I asked if I could make a case for going to church. God's word is our authority. We need his word to survive. The Bible gives us one another commandments that are impossible to obey without Christian community. So there's certain commands that the Bible gives uh, that assume other things that might not be stated that are nonetheless required for us to obey. The church is Christ's bride. He adores it with deep affection. It offends him when we detach ourselves from it. And it honors him when we throw ourselves into the life of it. He means to purify us as his church in this context using his word. And his word gets to specify what we do with our bodies, our vocations, our relationships, and our money. He took this all very well with humility, and he said he appreciated it. Then I spoke with a Native American drunkard. Who, that was his own admission. It was his own self-description who spoke of Mother Earth. He let me read part of Genesis 1 to him. I think he was a part of the local homeless contingent. He let me read part of Genesis 1 to him, and I spoke about God as creator, us as creatures. He later claimed to be a Christian and repetitively said that he was glad that I wasn't Mormon. But I stressed that we can't be right with God by not being like other people and not even by being good ourselves. We need God to forgive us. It was a difficult conversation since he was drunk, but he said he'd return next week for more. A Christian couple took a tract. They circled back to us and asked if they could pray with us, pray for us. Sorry, pray with us. I genuinely love hearing the Southern accent of a not from Utah man praying for me with his genuine love for Jesus. These little encounters are part of God's ongoing encouragement. I spoke to Savannah. She was a BYU student, and we call them return missionaries, uh, recently returned from having served a, for, uh, an LDS or Mormon mission. The ladies do a year and a half. We spoke on the Trinity and whether God has ever been a sinner. That's actually an issue in Utah. She said it wasn't critical to know whether God was always God or whether he ever was a sinner. I explained what I call the Christian monotheistic impulse, paraphrasing C.S. Lewis. The sweetest thing in all my life, quoting Lewis here, has been the longing to reach the mountain, to find the place where all the beauty came from. Christians don't settle for worshiping a lesser deity, a conduit, an intermediary of truth and beauty. We want to know where all the beauty comes from. To repent is to change our minds about, in part, knowing whether God is, is this God that I speak of is important. So I shared some Isaiah verses. Later, Mark and Christian, a local Christian couple, dropped by and said hi. Later, we spoke to an older lady. She was very sweet, but very sensitive, very defensive when I told her that the tract that I had given her was about submitting her feelings under the authority of Scripture. She immediately bore her testimony, so to speak, that the Book of Mormon was true. I was extra patient with her. I shared with her some apologetic stuff I'll skip over. I invited her to turn ne uh, return next week and speak to us, and we exchanged COVID-19 elbow bumps. After this, I spoke with a BYU student 
and her friend. She was Jewish by heritage. I'm going to skip over this part. <clears throat> At the beginning, this man, I call him G, I'm not sure why I uh, just used the, the, the letter, introduced himself and he, he said he worshipped the same God as we did and that he enjoyed having these conversations. He was Mormon. I, I said we did not worship the same God, but I definitely enjoyed having these conversations. Her, his friend was sharp, informed, and had very specific questions. In the middle of our conversation, a homeless guy, Cody, perked up his ears at our God talk and joined the conversation. He said he had been released from prison in March. He was blunt, saying something like, I'm a drug addict. I was hoping that God would speak with me tonight. I'm going through a lot, and I need a good word. So we stopped the existing conversation, and I shared 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In Romans 5, 1, since therefore we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, 28, for we, know, we know that for those that love God, for those that are called according to his purpose, all things work together for good. For those that love God, for those, I think I rearranged the phrases there. At Romans 8, 28, he said, I like that one. I shared the gospel with him and gave him info for a local church. And I invited him to return next week to speak with us. Is Ezra here? Ezra is going to give us a quick presentation of something called, I think, Two Ways to Live. They have been learning to share the gospel under Jake. And I'd love to hear yeah, so we'll use how the you do it. Please do. So yeah, in you through our Sunday school, we've been going over a simple way to explain the gospel to people. And he uses we use the drawings to go with it. You have six squares, so we have six six parts to the gospel that we're explaining, and with each one we have a verse. So it starts out where God God existed before all things. He created the world and he created us to rule over the world. Let me find the verse real quick. The verse to this is Revelation 4.11. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. But is that the way now? We all reject God as our ruler and try to live our lives or be the ruler of our own lives instead of allowing God to rule over ourselves. But God, we're skipping the verse. The verse for this is there is no one righteous, not even one. There are no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. The question is, what will God do about this rebellion? So God won't let us rebel forever. And the punishment for our sin is death. Hebrews 9.27 Man is destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. God's justice sounds harsh, but because of his love, he has sent his son to the earth to then die on the cross for our sins in payment for our deeds. Which Christ died for our sins once for all, all, the righteous for the righteous, to bring you to God. 1 Peter 3, 18. But that's not all. God then raised Jesus from the dead, and he then rejoined him and be rulers over the world. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous... Oh, wait. Wrong verse, I just read that one. 
Okay, so it's 1 Peter 1, 3. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth in living hope through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, where does this leave us? We then have a choice. Choice A is to be rulers of our own world, living in sin for our own desire, and the result of that is death. Or we can choose to follow God, let him rule over our lives, following him in his instruction, and the result of that is eternal life and salvation. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. John 3, 36. The question we end with is which one of these options represents the life you're living now? That's it. Thank you, Ezra. Uh, I call this napkin evangelism. It's something you can do with a pen and a napkin. Uh, it's great because it's got... Uh, icons or graphics that you can point people to, and he associated each of these sections with a, a word from God's word, the Bible. So this is simple. It's amazing. Uh, the class, one of the classic ways I was taught to do this is um, the four spiritual laws. Um, and you could, if you wanted to read that, you could glean parts from it that are helpful. Uh, there's parts of it that could be reworded um, that don't seem as helpful. But uh, thank you so much, Ezra. Don't you just love the simplicity of that? Thank you so much. Okay, so our last review. Uh, evangelism is, strictly speaking, verbally communicating the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with the call to repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins and for the receiving of eternal life. By evangelism, one may also refer to the activity one engages in with the imminent goal of sharing the gospel. Relational evangelism is with those we have recurring interactions with, and stranger evangelism, equally valid, is with people you likely will never see again. Conversational questions that have been helpful. What is your faith background? What do you believe? Or do you go to church anywhere? What are some of the biggest differences between what you believe and what Christianity teaches? Have you ever heard an evangelical Christian summarize the gospel before? Have you ever heard the gospel? Has anyone ever explained the gospel to you before? And you could build on that. If they say yes, you can simply ask, well, what did they say? Or if they say no, your heart can be provoked to the reality. They don't have any, at least to their memory, any memory of the gospel ever being summarized and you can offer to. <laughs> Greetings. Develop a personal terminology for greeting others that is especially warm and familial to other believers and kind and welcoming to strangers. Open-ended questions. Ask these. They can be potentially reciprocated, aimed back at you, and this is to your advantage, both for getting to know people for its own sake and for opening the doors to gospel conversations. The rubric we used for communication in evangelism does anybody have that memorized? Memorized. Yeah. Sharing and uh, declaring and then correcting and encouraging. Yes. Listening, questioning, sharing, declaring, and correcting and encouraging, which is the last two for today. Patient listening shows wisdom, reduces tension. It helps one ponder how to answer, and it gives you an opportunity to silently pray. Asking curious and probative questions helps you understand, helps you take pleasure in understanding and to know the pur purpose of another person's heart. Helps you learn more about people who are in the image of God and therefore interesting. And it helps you find out if someone understands the gospel. It also helps you show warmth and hospitality. Restating what another person says can show that you are listening. It can test whether something is meaningful. It can cut through rhetorical flourish, show optimism over the God-given value of language, and graciously improve upon another person's poor communication. The mode of sharing offers up something for consideration. It has an accent on courtesy. You might ask, would you mind if I shared some reasons 
for why I believe that. Would you mind if I showed a verse from the Bible to you on that topic? Would you mind if I took a few minutes to explain that? Consider becoming intimately familiar with one of the four Gospels and learn to share Jesus' stories from it in your evangelism. You can lead in with, do you know what Jesus said about that? Or do you remember when Jesus, or straightforwardly, can I share a Jesus story with you? You can have some fun in sharing those stories, dramatizing, involving the other person, and even prompting other people to fill in the own blanks. Fill in the blanks. You can share your own story of what God did to save you <clears throat> and how he has been faithful to you, overflowing with the theme of God's goodness. As you share, make sure God gets the glory. Include in the story how you came to encounter God's word and his promises. Weave within it elements of the gospel and passages from the Bible itself, even if just to retrospectively make sense of what God was doing to you. Then bring it back to the authority of God's word which sheds light on our own history <clears throat> and speaks with infinite authority. <clears throat> Learn to rise to the level of bold assertion, as the gospel is not a suggestion. It's not merely for sharing. The gospel is by its very nature a proclamation of the person and work of Jesus Christ. One way to think of this is sharing God's testimony. You can appeal to God's word even before another person is convinced that it is God's word. You don't have to be a philosopher or a lawyer. You are authorized and empowered to be an ambassador for Christ and the good news of his death and resurrection. Spurgeon writes, We preach not the gospel by your leave. We do not ask tolerance nor court applause. We preach Christ crucified, and we speak boldly as we ought to speak, because it is God's word and not our own. We are accused of dogmatism, but we are bound to dogmatize when we repeat that which the mouth of the Lord has spoken. We cannot use ifs, and for we are dealing with God's sh shalls and wills. If he says it is so, it is so, and, that, <clears throat> and there is the end of it. Controversy ceases when Jehovah speaks. Boast in the Lord, in his supremacy, in his glory, in his accomplishments, this is part of the de declaring mode. His goodness, his power, his kindness, his son, his work. John 1 says, We have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Peter writes, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Boast in the supremacy of Christ over all false religions, over all alleged alternatives, and boast of Christ's exclusivity. Christ says, I am the way. This is a great evangelism verse to just memorize. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I have heard that. Restated by evangelists on the street countless times. It just comes up over and over. A brief note about street preaching, just in case a young man in this audience wants to give it a go someday. This can be helpful with larger groups of people. In a situation where you're not disrupting the work of other Christians, and typically where the traffic is slow moving or has to stop to wait in line or across the street, it can also create conversations. It is a tremendous way to test your courage, to fight your cowardice, and to herald the gospel. If you try it, here are some tips. Slow down. Chances are people can barely make out what you're saying. Simplify. Pause. Shorten your sentences. Enunciate. If you have to sound a little silly or goofy or weird, that's okay. Speak from, I think they call it the diaphragm. Don't blast your throat. Pick a few Bible verses to repeat. And don't be afraid to repeat yourself, as you are likely speaking to a new set of people <clears throat> every few minutes. And do not feel the need to be purely extemporaneous. Prepare a three-minute, sorry, prepare a three-point, perhaps, or, or perhaps a 45-second sermon. And memorize it as your starting point. Use your hands. 
invite people to come to you. This has served me as a way to create conversations. Another note on summarizing the gospel. This is relevant to all modes of evangelistic communication. Learn to summarize the gospel. You can practice with a friend. You can try sharing it with your kids at the dinner table. So here's the challenge. Summarize the gospel in 30 seconds. And then in two minutes. And then in five. Write it down. Polish it. Memorize the outline. Pick your favorite and most beautiful way to say it. And tuck it away. Because you'll want to reuse it. It's the gem in your pocket. Ask yourself, if you had an evangelistic opportunity to share the gospel right now, it was just dropped in your lap, could you summarize the good news of the cross in the time that was given to you? Peter writes in 1 Timothy, sorry, 1 Peter 3, in your hearts, honor honor Christ as, excuse me, in your hearts, Honor Christ the Lord as holy, being always prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Let's finish our series by talking about the mode of correcting and encouraging. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, Paul writes, Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant, controversies, for you know that they breed quarrels. In the Lord's servant, in the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This is an astounding passage. Paul does not want us to quarrel. You might think of quarreling as a kind of foolish, uh, feisty, uh, non-productive conflict over things that are not the most important Uh, losing your composure, losing your courtesies. I've had to repent of that many times. Paul does not want us to quarrel. It's not fitting as God's servants. Yet, he expects that as we are kind to everyone, we should continue teaching and correcting our opponents. So we're not merely sharing information. We're teaching others. And we're not merely teaching. We're correcting And we're not merely correcting, we're correcting opponents. People who are against us. And as we do this, Paul expects that we're going to encounter significant resistance. So much so that he says, patiently enduring evil. So Paul expects that we'll be teaching, correcting, patiently enduring evil with opponents. And he says... Maintain your composure, essentially. Be kind as you do that and patient as you correct and teach. Many people would say, well, if we're going to be kind and patient, we ought not correct people. That's rude. (laughs) Paul says, correct people and be kind, right? Uh, In our culture, teaching people is, even that's countercultural. But Christians, we we teach our opponents. Isn't Isn't that amazing? What a verse. As a side note, note also Paul's confidence in God's sovereignty. The end of the verse, the passage. Why should we stick it out? Why continue to teach and correct with patience and kindness, even as our opponents are blinded and enslaved and ensnared and captured by Satan himself? Paul says, because God may perhaps grant them repentance. And not just any repentance, but one that opens their eyes to believe in truth. So evangelism really does aim at helping people see the truth and to love it and to repent and believe in it. This verse struck me especially years ago when I was hearing 
of evangelism and mutual interfaith dialogue in terms that completely had removed categories of repentance and truth. It's more about social manipulation and sort of uh, being nice and sort of warming people away into the kingdom. This is not a matter of social engineering or manipulation. This is the supernatural work of God. I will gladly say here that nearly all of my enthusiastic, persevering, hardworking, joyful partners in evangelism, nearly all of them have been convicted Calvinists. They trust that God himself may perhaps, Paul says, grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. This fuels us to press on and not burn out. It motivates evangelism. Just think about it. God might give someone repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Therefore, be kind and patient as you persist in teaching and even correcting your opponents. This motivates evangelism, and it can encourage you when you feel like the task of evangelism is impossible. When you encounter severe resistance, or this is the part stings, when you make awful mistakes in evangelism. There's no need to quarrel. There's no need to devolve into immaturity or despair or self-pity. Carry on. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. So let's get back to the topic of correction. One of the things that people most often need correction over is the notion that they are good people. This is a simple evangelism question. Do you think you are, good, you are a good person? If you died and God asked you, why should I let you into my kingdom? What would you say? Pe- people, I mean, it is incredible. People often answer, I'm a good person. Or I've done good things. Do you see yourself as a godly person? Would you consider yourself a good person? This is an excellent evangelism question. You'll often hear, uh, though, people's optimism and confidence in their own spirituality. And there's often an operating assumption behind the very common fallback. Have you heard this? It'll be all right. God knows my heart. It'll be okay. God will judge me based on my sincerity. Or it'll be okay. God will judge me based on my heart's intentions. As though this is good news. As though this is promising. I mean, as a Protestant, I hear that and I go, that's awful. (laughs) (laughs) Moses writes in Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. To be a Christian means to reach the end of your rope, to realize that you are not pure and that you desperately need to be born again. You need to be recreated from the inside out and forgiven. One of the most helpful and encouraging ways to approach this in evangelism is to learn from a man named Ray Comfort. If you want to search him up, just search for, say, Ray Comfort or Way of the Masters. I'm looking at you young adults and teenagers. Just Google if mom allows you to get a minute on Google or YouTube. I don't recommend that very much, but uh, uh, Way of the Master by Ray Comfort. Way of the Master by Ray Comfort. It's not complicated. It's very simple. If you watch his stuff, it might become a little repetitive, but it's super accessible and helpful. It's what a lot of evangelists have cut their teeth on. He's like the grandpa of a lot of Christian evangelists. Ray Comfort will get at the heart of the matter conscience by asking a person to take a test. It's called the good person test. He will ask them, have you heard of the Ten Commandments? Yes. 
Let me, let me give you uh, the good person test. Are you ready? And I'll ask a person, have you ever told a lie before? Yeah. Or he's, he's, he's a cheerful bloke. He's a, he's a neat guy. If they, if, if, uh, if they say no, he's like, ah, well, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever told a lie before? How many lies do you think you've told in your life? Just give me a number. What do you think? Thousands? Probably thousands? Well, what do you call a person who tells thousands of lies? A liar. That's right. Have you ever stolen anything before? So he's walking through the Ten Commandments. You shall not steal. Have you ever stolen anything? What do you call someone who steals something, even of small value? A stealer. No, that's a football player. It's called a thief. Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, that is, if you fantasize about a woman you're not married to, you have committed adultery in your heart. It's very serious about this. Have you ever done that? A great question, especially for young men, any man. Jesus calls that adultery. Have you ever done that? So he'll walk them through the Ten Commandments, and then he will summarize. So, and he has this, like, great, uh, just kind, uh, non-threatening way of doing this. So, by your own admission, you are a liar, a thief, a murderer at heart, an adulterer, a coveter. He'll teach them about coveting, blasphemer. He has a way of doing this that is kind and approachable and welcoming. What's his name again? And he uses this to make a beeline for the gospel as fast as he can. But if a person doesn't feel like they need the gospel, he spends more time in the law. If they don't soften up, if they don't show humility, if they are arrogant, if they insist still that they are a good person, he just continues to revisit the law of God. This is great because it cuts through all the, uh, the intellectual pretense and the sophistication and all the objections people have. And if you ever feel like you just get stuck, just go straight for the Ten Commandments. The law of God is a mirror. It shows us how pure and holy God is. And it teaches us by way of contrast by how sinful we are. I have other quotes about that, but I need to make haste. a person shows some humility and even basic acknowledge of their sin, Ray takes them to the gospel. He shares the good news of a good judge that must punish sin. He has done so in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And he clearly calls them to repentance and faith. Okay, on those who claim to be Christians. Another reason Christians doing evangelism must responsibly enter into the mode of correction. It's probably the least uh, glamorous mode of evangelism. It, it, it's, it's a lot easier to sell listening and sharing and, and uh, questioning, but correction? Hmm. We live in a country where many people claim to be Christian. They think of themselves as Christian, but they do not understand the gospel or repentance, and they have not been born again. So we have a weighty task before us. We have to ask diagnostic questions about a person's faith. We're not there to judge them. We are not the judge that they need to worry about. But we want them to know Christ. So we must help them see the seriousness of their condition. And this means we must confront the reality of those who claim to be Christians and are not. So uh, I should have developed this more here. Learn to ask diagnostic questions about the genuineness and credibility of the profession of someone's faith. This is what a good, healthy local church does, by the way. We do that here where before membership, you meet with an elder. And there is, you know, this is a a Christian tradition of gauging the credibility of the profession of someone's faith before receiving them into church membership. 
Well, we should just kind of learn to do that naturally. It's just you ask feeler questions, and you're figuring out whether someone is committed to a local church, whether they understand the gospel, whether they um, are uh, committed to obedience to Christ. Colossians 1.28 says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So many, many interactions in the street consist of us having to speak to people who claim to be Christians. They don't go to church. We try to be gentle, make a case for going to church, but we often have to make a warning. The Bible says that those who continue in sin are not born of God. The Bible says, by your fruits you shall know them. The Bible says you ought not be enjoying the assurance of your salvation. If you have detached yourself from the people of God, if you are not repenting, if you are not walking by faith, if you're not walking by the Holy Spirit, confessing your sins, growing, being sanctified, and you ought to feel yourself on a treacherous path. The warning here is the high stakes. I'm not here merely to be nice. Think about the kind of regrets and desire. You know, think about the kinds of things people will wish you had shared with them someday if they are in hell. The high stakes here are heaven and hell. The high stakes here is life and death. High stakes also um, leading your children down a path that is misleading them or leading them to God. But really, your soul is at stake here. <clears throat> and now uh, for encouraging. There are a class of people who are, you might say, not far from the kingdom. In Mark 12, 34, Jesus, when he saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So there, do, there does seem to be people in whom God is at work. They might not be a believer. You, you might not have the basis for which to be confident in their faith. But God is at work, and we want to fan into flame what's going on. We want to help nudge them along in the direction they're already going. So there's a mode of communication where you're excited and you're affirming and encouraging what God's doing in their life and the kinds of things they're already exploring and reading and thinking about. Another group of people that need encouragement from evangelists in the mode of evangelism are people who are weak in their faith. We meet some people who I think are believers, but they're so uh, wrecked by doubt and uh, anxiety or uh, worry that they're not a Christian. You know, I, I believe in Jesus, but I, I'm just, I'm having a rough time right now. I'm, I feel like I'm, in a, in a, I'm wallowed in, wallowing in sin, and I've been really... You know, I just don't know if God loves me. I mean, all sorts of people like that. And it's encouraging to remind them of the gospel. That's why I say it's the mode of evangelism. Do you repeat the gospel? We do this with ourselves in the mirror as Christians. We remind ourselves of the gospel. So you just share the same thing to them that you would share with an unbeliever, in, in a sense. You remind them that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. There is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. So there's a lot of overlap. And if you gauge that they are a believer, encourage them. A, a man once approached Jesus and said, I believe, help my unbelief. So encouraging them that God is not waiting for your faith to be strong to receive you. He gladly receives and accepts your weak faith and your weak but genuine repentance. God, and this is especially where you can gladly and heartily say, it doesn't matter if it sounds sappy, God loves you. God loves you. He accepts your weak faith. Go right back to him. He loves to hear from you. A few more stories. October 11th, 2018. The most substantive conversation tonight at the north gate of Temple Square is with Peter, a visiting believer from Montana. He said he was trying to work up to having enough faith to get back on the path. I asked him some basic gospel questions. 
He understood the gospel quite well, but was not internalizing it. I encouraged him that God completely accepted his weak faith. I told him the story in Mark 9 of the man who said, I believe, help my unbelief. I said, God's not waiting for you to be good enough. He's not waiting for your faith to be good enough. We revisited and reviewed the gospel. Christ's righteousness, Christ's righteousness given to us. Our sins credited to Christ. Weak believers counted righteous in Christ. Perfect Jesus counted a sinner on our behalf. Last story. We'll do some questions. June 28, 2019. I spoke with Greg, who was visiting from St. George. He says he works in the ICU and has some relationships with local Christian pastors. But he attends the Mormon church still as his home, church home, and center of fellowship. But he does not believe in Mormonism. He rejects its core claims about priesthood authority, the great apostasy, exclusivity, about God's own ancestry. He also thinks that Joseph Smith was a liar, but he inexplicably continues that is, participating in the Mormon faith. I explain that he has a duty, if he claims to be a disciple of Jesus, to reject religious table fellowship with idolaters and instead to seek fellowship with true believers. At this, he was incredulous. He did not think worshiping a God who has ancestors is idolatry. And he did not think it was possible to find any church with sound doctrine or genuine people. And he did not think it was possible to judge a person's heart. But Paul says, quote, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So can we judge a person's heart? Not in the final sense, but can you make a provisional evaluation of a person's genuineness such that you can obey that commandment? Paul says, call upon the name of the Lord with those who have a pure heart. <laughs> so you've got to make an evaluation about a community of people who have a pure heart. Paul also says, 1 Corinthians 5, not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed or is an idolater. He said he would not leave the LDS church unless God told his heart to do so. But I explained that the Bible is God's word. It is breathed out by the Holy Spirit. I told him he should prove his faith by seeking special fellowship with authentic believers and take the plunge and leave Mormonism behind. That if he did not do this, he has a false assurance of his own faith. His most special human affection, his one, his love one another life, should chiefly be with genuine believers in a local fellowship. It sounds like it's the cost of discipleship for him, perhaps his own wife and kids. He shared the story of his own twin brother who left Mormonism and became a Christian. And he lost his wife and his kids over it. it happens in Utah. <clears throat> Somebody leaves the Mormon church, becomes a Christian, and the spouse decides that's the grounds for divorce. Oh, what sorrow. But his twin brother is now a Christian minister. Other stories, but I will stop there. Um, yeah, let's spend a few minutes doing Q&A. I was terrible at making a time slot for Q&A this series. Any comments, final comments? Thoughts? I think it's great that uh, you keep it simple because uh, you have to have, know how to get from A to B. Um, one thing I would say is make sure you're... Uh, present your testimony well, not fumbling, bumbling, and you're, you're promote, maybe promoting sin more than the, the transformation of Christ in you, uh, but also uh, the boldness, and, and have that have your lifestyle back that up, that's vital. Because mm. if you say one thing, and they look at your lifestyle, <laughs> um, yeah. mm. I have to agree with that wholeheartedly. The most important evangelistic tool we ourselves living for Christ mm. actively. Uh, I repent of that every day, <laughs> you know, because I fail God every day in some way. Mm -hmm. Even though I want to live and glorify God on a daily basis at 
work, no matter where I'm at, I still tend to fail in that area somehow, some way. Now, it may be in a way that they don't even see it, but I see it. Mm -hmm. and, and unless you're constantly living in a repentant lifestyle, and that's getting that fresh relationship with God on a daily basis, acknowledging your own sin, and asking for the power of the Spirit to control you to do what is right, to glorify God. That, all the other testimony, you can know scripture, you can, you can uh, repeat it from one, from Genesis to Revelation, but if you're not living it and they don't see it, it's worthless. Mm. And that's kind of what I see. Just a follow-up comment uh, to what David had said, and that is, there, there are two aspects I see in this. One of them is having a pure heart that God's going to work through you, which is the point you're making. That can have a different impact in relational evangelism, where somebody sees your life. Mm -hmm. In stranger evangelism, they have no idea what kind of person you are, you know, if you're a charlatan or if you're genuine. You know, and so uh, I see the consistency of life having a lot more impact in a relational dynamic than it does, you know, in just somebody you meet on the street. Mm. Some really good wisdom just in, when you talk about, you know, having a summarization of the gospel in 30 seconds, two minutes, five minutes, and have a, a few different versions, have to be comfortable with those, and then as you get into those, those relationships, those conversations, whatever, kind of recognizing what you're in, right? Like what, what's that opportunity out there? And uh, have, have the comfort about it, you know, what you're in, what you can say. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd invite you all to join us this spring. Um, we're going to pull the trigger here soon. We go out every other Friday to the plaza and probably look at other possible venues. Uh, if you've never done it before, or if you feel like you're not equipped to and you can only just come and pray and shadow, you would be warmly and eagerly welcomed to come and just make it an opportunity for Christian friendship. Come join the brothers and just hang out with us. Um, we'll be handing out tracts and starting gospel conversations. And it's just a lot of fun. It's a neat way to meet friends with other believers. Um, and we'll do some briefing and debriefing and prayer and singing before and after. Sometimes some of us will grab a bite. Um, <clears throat> but if you need to get your feet wet, this would be a great way to do it. And if you've never done it before, um, or you rarely do it, uh, maybe give it a try once a year, maybe. Uh, and, and, and maybe all that will do is just help you better pray for the Christians that are out there doing it. Um, Caleb, would you pray? Pray us out. Heavenly Father, we thank you just for the truth of the gospel. We thank you for the, the power that it has to change people's lives. God, I just pray that you would do things in our this class and the truths that we know from the scriptures. You would help us, Father, to be bold and Proclaiming truth, that you would equip us to, um, to speak it clearly and concisely, Lord. And Father, I do pray that, uh, that you would bless the, the ministry of evangelism at our church, God. Uh, we would see it grow and we would see uh, the fruit of that labor, Lord, and, and the salvation of sinners. And, uh, I pray all these things in your name.